All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Amy, this is Patricio, um, and we're with Heartland Alliance for Human Needs and Human Rights. And um, we are here to tell you a little bit about, um, I, well, I guess in the spirit of Shy Hack Night, we're here to help you understand your city better. And one part of your city is this, one of the kind of largest and oldest uh, social service organizations in the city. Um, and that's us, Heartland Alliance for Human Needs and Human Rights. Um, how many people, by a quick show of hands, um, before tonight were f knew of Heartland, had heard of us? Nice. Um, how many of those folks um, could tell the person next to them what we do? There's the problem, right? <laughs> that is the problem. And so Patricia and I want to tell you about an effort that we have going at Heartland that, whether willingly or not, we're, the two of us are somewhat involved in, um, and, and spearheading a little bit at this point to help change that problem, the hand raising problem that we just saw. Um, and part of it is about helping us really truly become, transform um, into an organization that is characterized by being highly innovative and highly effective and becoming a laboratory of learning about the most effective anti-poverty interventions out there. If we do that, we're going to have this host of other things happening, but one of the other things that's going to happen is that in a room full of people like this, hopefully every single person would raise their hand and be able to say, we know what Heartland's doing, they're doing all of these amazing things to end poverty, um, and you'd be able to tell your neighbor about that. Uh, so we're going to tell you a little bit about that effort, um, and to start, I think it's a little helpful actually to um, start with a little bit of a history lesson, like a Heartland history lesson, a sh Chicago history lesson. Um, and really because Heartland was established back in the late 1800s, so in 1888, and we were established as the nation's second Travelers and Immigrants Aid Organization. Uh, so you see people nodding, you kind of recognize that name. And really, we were founded out of the settlement house movement. So if you remember back, you might have gone on a field trip to the Hull House if you grew up here over on Halstead. Um, you know, Jane Addams founded the Hull House uh, and was the leader of the Settlement House Movement, and she was one of our founders um, at Heartland Alliance as well. Now, we've grown a lot um, over the 20th century, that's for sure, and we've changed a lot. Um, interesting fact, though, we still run our Traveler's Aid Program. If you've been at O'Hare Airport and you see those information kiosks, that's Heartland's Traveler's Aid Program. So that's our legacy program. So if you need assistance at the airport, um, we are there still shepherding travelers um, and immigrants and refugees and people who come through O'Hare Airport and helping them navigate transportation and more broadly the city. So I, you know, I was in Barcelona last year. Um, Patricio's going there next month. So I started to think that in many respects, Heartland is a little bit like Gaudi Sagrada Familia. We have been under construction for 100 years, for a century. We, are, we still have cranes up. We are constantly adding. Um, we are constantly refining. Uh, we are adding detail. We're shaping. Um, and so we become this kind of un constant under construction entity. And this is not entirely, not, not at all unique to Heartland. Um, a lot of people in the social, a lot of organizations in the social service structure are kind of this exact same way. Uh, and some really good examples of how we've been, of how we've done this over the years. You know, we were kind of the first organization in Chicago to respond to the homeless crisis in the 80s when that became kind of a prevailing and very recognizable social problem. We founded the, helped found the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, which you might be familiar with. Um, we were the first place in the city to open up a homeless youth shelter when we realized that the face of homelessness was changing and that it wasn't the, the single man on the street that everybody might have thought it was. Um, we led the effort to um, relocate uh, 7,000 Hurricane Katrina evacuees to Chicago. We put 27,000 people back to work through the country's largest jobs program during the recession. Um, we were the first responders in the city to the AIDS, HIV AIDS crisis. Um, so as social problems have evolved and emerged, so too has Heartland, so too has the rec rest of our kind of social service uh, uh, industry. But if I'm really honest, I think it's a little bit grandiose to compare Heartland 
um, to a beautiful, well-planned and thought-out cathedral. Does anybody recognize this picture? Yeah. City Museum in St. Louis. If you have not been there, you absolutely have to go there. It is amazing. Um, but really what it is, oh, sorry, that got really grainy blown up. Um, it doesn't matter because it still kind of looks like that even when it's crystal clear. It is just this amazing maze of reused and recycled objects and things kind of put together in these amazingly unique ways, um, fit together crazily to make this really interesting maze and jungle gym um, for adults, really. Um, and you can kind of climb through there, but it's all just individual pieces that are pushed together to make this whole that actually works. Um, and that's really interesting, but that doesn't necessarily have kind of one cohesive um, um, identifying um, visual or, uh, you know, it doesn't look like any one thing. It's a hodgepodge, really. And that, again, is really indicative of kind of our industry. Um, we are an industry that, um, to some degree, is at the women fancy of funders. Um, so there's no way for us to just basically get um, a large sum of money to do whatever we would like with. We get money to do something very specific with a very specific population. So that's why we end up looking like this. We cobble it all together. And to add on to that complexity, think about, think about data in that context. Think about the information and data that we're collecting in that context. For years and years and years, decades, our industry and at Heartland, we were thought of as charity. In many respects, people still think of the work of our sector as charity. And so when you're a charity and you have this, what do you do data-wise? You kind of just count things. How many slides do we have? You know, how many <laughs> airplanes do we have? Um, in, you know, in real terms, how many people do we serve? How, what services do we provide? And that's really, if you are only giving money as a funder um, and you're only providing services to be charitable, what more do you really care about? But there's a fundamental shift going on at Heartland and in our field that is a recognition that we're not doing charity, we're doing human rights work, we're doing social justice work, and we're working for racial and social equity. And if that's the case, then we have a moral obligation to make sure that we're doing the most effective work possible. And that means we're gonna have to collect some better data we cannot just be counting widgets. We have to be um, assessing our outcomes and our impact in a much more meaningful way. And then taking that information, reflecting on it, teasing apart what it's telling us, and then changing the work we're doing based on it. So we need to, be, we need to stop doing the things that just aren't effective. I'm sure that any of the nonprofits in this room, us included, are doing things that really aren't that effective. We need to stop doing them. But we need to first figure out what they are. <laughs> and then we need to do more of what works. And so we need to be testing great new innovative ideas to ending and addressing poverty. Uh, but we need to have an infrastructure in place to do it. And that gets hard because we have, at Heartland, we are five different legal entities. And these are our legal entities. Heartland Alliance is the parent company, and our research department and Patricio's IT department sit in that parent company, the Alliance, um, and other shared services are there, like uh, accounting and human resources, marketing, and that sort of thing. And then each of these individual companies is its own 501c3. So they each have their own board of directors, uh, they have their own you know, budgeting process, and all of the things that comes with being your own 501c3. And you can see by the names listed up here in the different logos that we do really diverse work. Really, really diverse work. We have a whole international arm of the organization that works on um, gender uh, and sexual uh, equity issues, um, workers' rights issues in Central America, Africa, the Middle East. Uh, we have our Heartland Health Outreach, um, which is providing all sorts of different health care, um, primarily to people who are experiencing uh, homelessness. 
we have our housing division, which we have a colleague in the back who can tell you all about it. But in short, they um, provide, or they build and maintain affordable housing in the city. Well, in the Midwest, really. And then Heartland Human Care Services does almost anything else you can think of. Um, so this is stuff all the way from um, alternatives to juvenile detention, asset building, jobs programs, um, HIV prevention, all sorts of different things in that bucket. So the work that we do, layered on top of our organizational complexity, um, is kind of mind-bogglingly -bogging, crazy to wrap your head around. Um, do I want to say anything more about that? I could go on and on about we it. We could go sure on the mind-boggling yes. aspects of that experience. So what are we actually trying to do here? Our North Star is to transform Heartland Alliance to a point where we have the ability and organizational capacity for evidence-based programming, so knowing what works, data-informed decision, understanding what we need to stop doing and what we need to do more of, and an opportunity to tell that story to everybody, right? Is there a special sauce underneath our alliance that we can identify what mix of services actually are the best mix of services to bring people out of poverty. And we think that measuring outputs is not the way to do that. Measuring outcomes is. And stacking those outcomes together to understand how we're impacting communities, right? So if this is our North Star, we need to figure out how to get there, right? So what we think is uh, a key to this is data systems. As Amy mentioned, um, with that hodgepodge, those five entities, those funders, data is distributed across hundreds of data systems and in formats and in a posture that's primarily focused on collecting outputs, right? So what we're looking to do is develop uh, or, or develop a combination of people, process, and technology, everybody's three favorite words probably in this room, um, to support the organizational data capabilities and usage. So when you look at this, um, this is the ideal state, right? We have a data dictionary that's defining the data that we're collecting. We have our data sources on the left, right? Data is moving through our ETL layer into a data warehouse, in through that vis visualization layer, and we learn. This is what we want to do, um, and this is what we're hoping. I think that this diagram is probably common or probably could be used in many different instances, although maybe not with the Heartland Alliance color branding. but. Um, this is the ideal state, right? But even if this diagram is common, we do have our own unique challenges. And those unique challenges are that almost none of it exists at Heartland Alliance. <laughs> so if you look at this, uh, data flow, knowledge flow, not really working too well, and a lot of vaporware up there. But um, so, so Underneath those five organizations, we have somewhere upwards of 110 programs. Those 110 programs have their 110 funders plus, right? So all of that data collection is happening for them. Um, and we also don't necessarily have a system of record for some of those programs. Excel, <laughs> access, uh, PDF files, these types not of things, systems. right? So they're not systems. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, we have the, the challenge of operating in five different uh, industries, right? So the services that we provide range from law firms to property developers to healthcare providers. How do you find a single system or a data system of record for all of those organizations, right? Um, and lastly, this data infrastructure, BI infrastructure, just doesn't exist at all. So this is the challenge that we're facing and that we're trying to work through right now. So where are we at? Um, right now we're making a map. Uh, this is Middle Earth. We could have used Westeros, but I think you get the point here. We're trying to get a sense and get our bearings of where and how to approach this challenge, right? Um, but we do think that it's a worthy endeavor, even if you look back at that other slide and see that there's so much work to do. Because of the breadth of our services, we feel like we have a unique data opportunity to uncover something and truly innovate in the industry that we're in, right? So we think that moving from outputs to outcomes is gonna be something that we're going to be able to do. We think that those outcomes combined together are gonna to be able to show how we are impacting communities. We also think that we'll be able to uncover the mix of, of services that uh, will move the needle the most for ending poverty. And we think that our data systems will allow us to actually connect people more quickly to move them through those um, services. So we think we have a unique opportunity um, 
given, given that breath of service. So um, the things that are keeping us up at night right now are the key questions as we try to start moving through this process is just really what can we learn from other industries that are maybe further along in the innovation and learning um, aspects of their uh, maturation? Um, are our challenges actually different or the same than those industries, right? Um, and what can we do now, because we know that that vaporware is gonna take a long time to build, what can we do with the data sets that we have right now to begin and to jumpstart that innovation and understanding and learning? What opportunities do we have? What tools are already out there that are available for us? And then lastly, when is enough on the planning and when can we just start doing? So, you know, this is a little bit of a uh, tour and understanding of what we're working on right now and how we're trying to build a innovation center at Heartland Alliance. Um, I think it was mostly just therapy for you and me. Is that right? Yeah, I think like, we needed somebody to share this chest, with. Yeah. It was a lot, but. Uh, but we'd love to hear your, your comments, your questions, snide remarks, whatever you have to offer up. Yes. How much of the data that you're looking at is really specific to your organization? How much of it would be useful for a larger population? That's a good question. So all of it, I would say, the vast majority of it is specific to our programs um, and our participants. Um, now that said, we have explored and talked a lot about um, long-term vision of once we get that data warehouse in place of being um, being a place where other researchers could come, um, people who have data, data analytics skills and say, hey, can I get some de-identified data here and let me see what I can learn from it. Let me see what relationships I can find. Let me see you know, what predictive analysis I can run on this. Um, so that's a, that's a big vision. That's really what we hope to be as kind of a, a center that's not just internally focused, but that's ex externally focused for the field. How will you get every, all the stakeholders on board to track the same uh, data, uh, and uh, how will you uh, work together on that? Because you also work in the, what four or five continents, so I don't know. It's, it's very challenging. And are you going to create another department, a team, or a section? Your question is like giving me a heart attack. <laughs> um, you do. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like, we can't answer it. Uh, but those are precisely the things that we're dealing with. And when we say map making, we're trying to figure out in exactly how to approach what you're saying. Um, one element that I can speak to specifically is that what we know we're going to have to do is short of working on technology at all, we need to develop a, a robust um, and comprehensive results framework for the organization. Um, so that every single intervention that we do, we have, you know, drawn the line in the sand and said, here's the outcomes we're looking to achieve. Um, and then building out from there what needs to change. So it's going to have a ripple effect into things like all of the paper forms that we fill out with our participants, the data, you know, obviously the data systems that we have. We need to um, negotiate so many different pieces that we don't even probably at this point know what we are. You've caught us at a very early moment in this process. Um, literally what we told you is, is where we're at. Um, and so we are just starting to plan for doing some of this work in our upcoming fiscal year, which would start in July. Might have yeah, I mean, I think you're hitting it right on the head. I think there's program interesting data that they need to be collecting for their funders. Um, there's company interesting data that they need to be collecting for, to understand how they're functioning. There's alliance interesting. There's industry interesting. How do you wrap that all up in a one framework that your data systems are collecting all. I think that's our biggest challenge that we're facing right now. I think the technology is likely not the biggest challenge. It's the change exercise of taking that many, um, you know, 110 programs that have been operating the way that they've been operating for a while and changing them and, and pointing, them in a, pointing them in a singular direction is a monumental effort, yes. And I'll just add, we have our, a meeting next week with a bunch of leadership from throughout all of the companies so you guys almost got a preview before they did of, of <laughs> what we're going to be talking to them about. They're so. probably watching right now. Yeah, yeah. it's live streaming. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the most, uh, maybe this, some of the most top outcomes that you'd like to be monitoring for are um, in maybe just one part of your business? Um, and how much of what you do today do you think 
is what you think you should be doing, and when you actually find a data you know you're going to be wrong. Yeah, it's a really it's an interesting point because you know when I mention our funders. Um, I don't think I'm exaggerating how much they drive the work of our sector. Um, dictate might be <laughs> a, a better word. And you know, people who work in the nonprofit space, you know what I'm talking about. So part of this is a really long-term vision for being able to actually start to change that conversation with funders. So if we can build an evidence base in our own organization for what works um, and an evidence base for what doesn't, we can be an entity that changes the conversation in the field, um, which is ultimately what it's going to take. It's going to take more than Heartland doing that. Certainly, it's going to take a, a lot more people. Um, but we need to get to a place where instead of being, you know, jumping when the funder says jump, that we say to the funder, here's how to tell <laughs> us all to jump. Um, and so that's really the hope. So I guess, you know, we'll be limited in our ability to really change a lot at first, but I think really long term, that's where we're hoping to go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do you have people who are like, who are like, they, who's a large part of their job to like identify the stuff that's working that you guys are not doing yet? Yeah. <laughs> Director of research. Um, no, and a lot of it is about surfacing you know, best practices and evidence space and the new and emerging promising practices in the field. And we do that, um, absolutely. Um, again, if there was a funder out there who was giving you a big, you know, big bunch of money to do whatever we would like with, those types of things would be a lot easier to do. Um, but you have to wait until a funder kind of gets the idea <laughs> and develops a funding stream for it to do it. So Housing First, you know, is a good example of that. We're still, as a homeless system, um, we have a shelter model. Shelters do not end homelessness. They put a roof over someone's head for the night. Um, so we know what works in a lot of these ways. We just um, don't do enough of the thing that's actually getting to the root cause of the problem, right? You're absolutely right. OK, let's go. You sir, on the end. You said you had 111 programs. I'm wondering how many of the same people, customers or clients, are, are accessing each of those, or some of many of those, multiples of those programs? We don't know. <laughs> are you looking at finding out? Yes. So that, that, that is another huge vision. That's probably one of the uh -huh. first questions we'd answer. Yes. Or try to answer with this exercise. Because we have all of these programs, but we have no internal way to link them up to different programs. There's eligibility considerations and the like. But that's something we think we could, an we could answer with some of our existing data that we have already. If we called it, cleaned it, matched it, um, we could try to figure out what some of that overlap is. Dan? I, uh, I thank you for the help you've given us. Are you doing anything with uh, concept mapping to uh, map the organization and, and how people are connected with each other uh, within the organization? There's some program directory discussions of how we would link that together in terms of overlap and services that are being provided or funders that are um, overlapping from a pass-through perspective or how far back does that funding source roll through um, or areas uh, where it's most likely that a participant would actually be receiving multiple services. So that, that exercise is started, but we haven't um, moved very far along that process. But I'd be interested to hear more about what tools that would be available to help us in that, absolutely. So are you all expecting to get to the ideal state with the team that you have currently, or are you expecting that you'll take this to leadership and then put together, like hire in, or look for the folks that you need? We're looking to hire in. <laughs> we, you know, to, to the question earlier, research and development teams or the ability to singularly focus on any sort of area, is something that we don't really have. Uh, it's not really something that's available to us in the nonprofit sector. We do have a lot of jack of all trades or people um, pulling at, pulling weight, let's call it. So we're gonna. We know we need to scale both on the Dana scientist side, but also the BI support side, the development side, the ETL side, all of this stuff. So we're looking at that as a um, heavy investment. So we're we're working on that proposal right now. Uh, I think it's a very exciting idea that um, if you guys get a research base and you have a clear story that you can tell funders based upon a solid research base that you're going to be able to uh, dampen some of the fickleness of funders as they move 
through program officers. Um, do you guys have a, is there, it's, it's a vision that I think I've heard other people articulate as well. Is there, are there case studies of organizations that have done that and who really have changed their relationship with funders? Hmm. It's a great question. <laughs> we, yeah, I wonder if anyone in the field is that is quite that far along. Um, one of the things on our to-do list is to go out and visit some organizations that have gone through kind of a technology change, like the one we're thinking of. Um, I think all of the ones that we're thinking of going out and visiting are so much smaller than Heartland. Like it all seems so much easier <laughs> um, at some single issue organizations and the like. Um, so I think that's going to be an actually a really interesting question to start probing with some of these organizations that we're um, going to be talking with is if and how um, this has been impacting their, their funding conversations. Certainly the, the endeavors have made their operational day-to-day -day function better. They're you know, able to reach more people or do it at a lower cost and those kinds of things. But actually influencing funders I think is that last piece that I, I don't know that we've, we've seen that yet. Sure. Um, Nonprofits often collect client information on sensitive topics that clients might not want to disclose. <coughs> For example, having suffered domestic violence. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with how the sensitive nature of your work can make that less reliable? <laughs> so that, uh, that's a great question. Um, a lot of the data that's already being collected, not for the use, for the purposes of this exercise, right? Um, is being, you know, we have a business associate agreement with the, the groups that we're storing it with or how we're collecting it. We're HIPAA regulated. So we do take security, privacy, all of that very serious. We haven't necessarily gone to that next level for the research uh, or the IRB review process or those types of things. I know you probably have a little bit more experience with that, but we do take the data collection process very seriously. And you're talking about how it might be, it might be not as reliable of, a, of data. Oh, okay. um, yeah, you know, I mean, like I, we're not remotely there yet. Um, so I think that's something that when we talk about data governance um, is going to be kind of top of mind. Um, hopefully we'll be able to fix some of the unreliability through really awesome training um, of our staff um, and very clear expectations around what's entered and how we calculate things and the like. Um, but we're certainly, that's gonna be one of those things that's probably an ongoing issue. I can't imagine a day when, you know, sensitive information like that is like the most highly reliable data in the world. Um, but again, just another one of these considerations, you guys are gonna pile on us so we don't sleep tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I'm gonna because I was trying to tweet out some of your <laughs> stuff, but uh, you know, being so, um, uh, uh, funder driven as nonprofits tend to be, how did you carve out the, the space and the, the breathing time and the resources to, to fund this effort? Mm -hmm. Many late nights. Uh, I don't know that we have uh, just quite yet. I mean, I think we're in the proposal stage. We're working with the board of directors to see if there's uh, specific solicitations that we can help fund this project. I think we may have open questions about how we do that long term. Um, that's, that's the reality that we're facing. I don't know that we've answered that question just quite yet. Have, have you had any <coughs> questions from, from funders where they kind of want to know about the effects of certain things and I mean, did that kind of drive this push at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, funders more and more are coming to the realization that they should be asking about your outcomes and your impact. Um, and not just how many people you served. So as a field, I think that human services are moving in more of this direction, and part of it is funder-driven. Um, and you know, we're pretty good, I think, at Heartland of when we get a new grant, um, putting some processes in place to collect the requisite information, um, but we are not good at thinking more broadly about what we should be collecting beyond what the funder wants us to collect. So we're meeting those needs. Um, it's not like they say to us, what were your outcomes? And we're like, ah, what's an outcome? Um, we don't, you know, we're not like that. Um, but we're not doing it in an organized and planful and systematic way across the organization. We'll go there and then back there. Um, to that point, what are some systems you guys have developed to kind of follow up with people that you have served, like long term? 
How might that look? That is definitely a case-by-case -case basis. So my, organ or my um, department at Heartland, um, we do um, evaluation and you know, research studies um, outside of kind of this whole data mess. Um, so let's say one of Heartland programs comes to us and says, hey, can you help us out? We have this grant. We need to do an evaluation of this program. Um, and we need to follow up with participants. We kind of put some processes in place to do that. Um, but by and large, we're not following up with participants after they leave. Um, our, for services. Part of it's that often there's no distinct endpoint. So people leave and just don't come back. And so it's not like there was this really clear cut moment of termination of services. So that makes it really hard um, sometimes to understand when you, sh when you consider them gone. Um, and another is, you know, pe people come to us at their most vulnerable moments. Um, and sometimes they want to be done with us, not because we were awful and we might have been amazing, but do you really want to be reminded of that time when you were really down on your luck um, and couldn't feed your family? Probably not. And so there's a dignity aspect to having people call you every six months and be like, hey, tell me how you're doing. I would like to know if I helped you. Um, so there's a whole lot of play there, but it's not definitely not happening much for many reasons. And I promised you in the back. About how many full-time equivalents do you have? 1,200? Is that right? 1,200, 1,600 workforce, probably, something like that. And the two areas that you have, technology and the research, how many people are doing that, besides the two of you? <laughs> Five have, on my team. I have 13, and that's to manage everything. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> Infrastructure, not this. <laughs> right, not this. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. All right, who wants it? That. Um, have you looked at maybe talking to the, the United Nations? Um, they're, you know, they, they seem to have a similar structure where they have their uh, UNICEF, um, IOM, and, and they have different specific areas of work. And they could be struggling uh, with the same problem, and they might be trying to solve it at this, at this moment along with that's great, thank you. You know, the other thing that when you were saying that that made me think of was to some degree Heartland Alliance is a lot like a university. Um, this big kind of overarching entity with these individual colleges in it. And so there might be some lessons learned too from some universities. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry.